I'm just so thrilled to be able to share um, her latest body of work with you, as I'm sure she is as well. I also grew up in Cuba. She attended art schools in Cuba. And um, she married an American and came to America and lived in LA where I first met her and now lives in Woodstock, New York, and is active in an exciting art center called um, Art Yard, which is in French, Frenchtown, New Jersey. So if any of you are ever in New Jersey, um, do go and visit and see what they're doing or look it up on um, the web because whatever I see about that is absolutely fabulous. Um, Elsa has exhibited in many places in Cuba as well as in the United States. Her work is in our collection, in the collection of the um, Museum of Women in the Arts in DC. And um, she's a prolific artist in many media and incredibly smart as you will see today. Um, so I am going to turn this over to her and she will take us through the latest body of work and how you came up with this idea and what you're doing with it. And then time allowing we can have questions, discussion, and you can also stay and talk to her informally within the reception as well. So um, please join me in thanking Elsa for sharing your work and for being here with us. Uh, thank you so much to each one of you for being here right now. I really appreciate it. This is my first time uh, in this place as a museum, but also in uh, Oregon. Uh, I'm extremely honored to have my work in this beautiful museum, and I'm so honored uh, to have Jill as my friend. She's an amazing person who's doing uh, remarkable things um, for a lot of people out there. Uh, so uh, this show, uh, the title is, as you can see, Paperweight. Uh, that was not my idea, it was my husband's idea. I was struggling with uh, a title for it, and at some point I said, I, I just need your help, because I'm, I'm a little lost. And when I'm saying that, it's just to be absolutely honest about how the creative process really goes, you know, in real life. Uh, so he came up with this, and I thought it was wonderful because it really reflects uh, what I was trying to do with this body of work. But that only happened at the end, when I had all the work ready. So I will tell you now what I did. <laughs> uh, so here you'll see six uh, series of works. If you look around, one is this. Then we have these pieces that have the great background. Uh, there are the small sculptures that are right in the middle of the room. And um, then uh, there are uh, three more. So all of them represent uh, the different elements that form the mind. But I think that for you to really understand what the story is, uh, I will tell you a story. So in 2005, <clears throat> um, I had a baby, and his name is Diego. And he's a wonderful little human being. So uh, when he was two and a half in 2007, uh, he was diagnosed with autism. Uh, it was a very unexpected thing for us as parents. And in the beginning, it was absolutely shocking because we were not prepared for something like that. So the first thing that we thought is, well, we need to learn the more, as much as possible, about this condition so we can help him. Uh, so as you can imagine, in a way I thought at the time that I was stopping my career as an artist, stopping absolutely everything, to dedicate my life to helping uh, our son. So, but I'll explain you now how things go when you are a creative person. So I started taking him to therapy every day uh, to different places. So. The way this works is that you go, he goes with a the therapy or the group of kids, normally it's one-on-one, -on -one, and then you wait in the lobby. So all the parents, what they did, they uh, went together to get coffee, but I don't drink coffee. Even though I, I love the smell, it's just, it, somehow it doesn't get along with my body, so I thought, man, I can't go with them to get coffee because it doesn't work, so I have to come up with something. So I started bringing little pieces of paper, uh, 
And I thought, well, while Diego is working and I could hear him interact with the therapist, I'm going to play with this piece of paper. So the first day I said, it was a game. So, and that's uh, what being an artist really is. It's about coming up with ways to deal with life and time and situations. So I started playing with that little paper and I folded it in some interesting ways and I thought, oh, this is pretty cool. And I said, okay, tomorrow I'm gonna bring a piece of paper and a pair of scissors and see what happens that day. So I started doing my thing. Third day I'm gonna bring the piece of paper, the scissors, and the exacto knife and a little uh, self-healing mat. And then the fourth day I told uh, some of the ladies, do you have a little table that we can put here? <laughs> and, and she said, sure, let's bring the little table. So before I knew, I wasn't even planning any of this. It was just a, a, a process. So at some point they just so oh, the lady with the, the crazy lady with the paper is coming back. So I started noticing like, oh, this is kind of interesting. Like from the beginning when I started playing with this to let's say a year uh, after that, I started noticing like Diego is doing amazing. Like he was learning so much from the therapist. His brain was changing so much. So was my relationship with paper. And then I discovered, I don't think this is happening casually here. This is actually pretty important what's going on here. So as he is developing and learning so much from these relationships that he's establishing, I'm doing the same through him, through my art. I don't know if you understand what I mean, but it was some kind of interesting interconnection. My son with the therapy, me with him, him with the therapist, the therapist with me, because we had to talk every day about, you know, how he's doing. <clears throat> so at some point, uh, my artist brain said, oh, wait a second. I mean, this is something. Something is happening here. So I'm going to be more intentional. So I basically said, I'm going to take this seriously. I really want to study this material, and I want to understand how far I can take it. But I was, what I was really saying, and I only know that now, was I'm going to work so hard on my son. I just want to see how far he can go and how much I can push that little brain to get to a place that I, I believe that he can get. At the time, he didn't have any language. He didn't look in your eye. He didn't have eye contact. Maybe some of you are a little familiar with autism and how it is. And to make the story really fast, I can tell you like today he's 13 years old. He's the most <laughs> articulate person you can imagine. <laughs> to the point that I have, I have to ask him like, stay quiet for a little bit because he's so expressive, very opinionated, very smart, very creative. And then when I look at my work, I don't really see my work, I see him in a way. And it's not only him, because this story is not only about Diego. It just happened to be that in my personal experience, I have a lot of mental illness uh, in the family. <clears throat> uh, my mother, I am one of eight children, so I have different conditions. And for some reason, I came up different. So it was a funny thing, because I was the one who felt different. <laughs> in an environment where everybody was dealing with something. Uh, so it was actually a gift uh, when I look back now because I learned so much from each of my relatives, starting with my mother who uh, suffers from uh, bipolar disorder and she's pretty amazing. So also to make the story short, I can tell you that all of them went through really, really difficult uh, challenges, but they are all alive and well and happy. I'm very proud that I have this show here right now. Uh, some of them are still in Cuba, some of them are in Miami, and some of them are in other parts of the world. Uh, so this is really my life, what you're seeing right here. And I didn't choose this work, the, the work just found me and said, please, can you make me happen? So I, I, I just became the channel, you know, to make that happen. And uh, so that's how this really um, was created. 
And of course, every series has uh, some kind of um, meaning behind. For example, let's start with this one. Uh, this one is about memory. Uh, later, if one day you want to come back with more time, you can read everything and there is a book that has been uh, uh, produced too. But I, I will tell you with my words from my own experience, uh, my son, my stepson is right here with his phone, he's filming me. <laughs> and he's a very important part of um, uh, my life because before, before I had my own children, I had him and I learned a million things with him. Um, believe it or not, he's represented in one of these pieces. This is my family, uh, my husband, my uh, two children, my stepson and I. I won't tell you who is who because we don't know. We're trying to figure out. <laughs> We're trying to figure out who we are. I haven't decided who I am. I. Maybe I'm a combination of all of them. Uh, but this is basically about memory, about the patterns that we build with our brains in terms of in the way that we remember things. And I was telling Miro, by the way, uh, when he came. That memory, in my opinion, I'm not a scientist, but I'm a human being that likes to observe other humans. And that's how I learn, uh, yeah, besides the books that I read. But I just noticed that every human, like right now, each one of us is unique in the way that we look at our past. Uh, some of us suffer our past, some of us um, um, miss our past. I mean, there are many ways to, to, to deal with that. And what I wanted to do with this piece was, um, in a way, to create a little bit of awareness that we also have the power to design and to, to uh, how can I say, to arrange the way in which we experience memory by being intentional. Like, for example, I try to remember things that if I don't try to remember them, they wouldn't even come to me. So I put some energy just to think, you know, how my life was when I was uh, five years old, or 20, or 30, or 46, that was last year. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so these pieces here basically talk about that pattern that we form in, uh, in the way we look at our memories. And um, if I was going to represent each of you in this way, we were going to have a, probably a wonderful show here with a great variety of ways to think about yourself. So when you look at them later in more detail, you'll notice that every tiny piece is unique. So it was cut with uh, scissors. So this is actually formed out of hundreds of tiny little pieces. And each one of them represents a memory. Uh, and that's how I sometimes think that we are. We are a, a combination of all those tiny little things that we experience. And as a whole, they form the body and the landscape that we have in our brains. That's just a visual way. Uh, so we can move uh, to the next series, which is this one over there. OK. So this series here is about language. And this one uh, is very connected to my son again. This one in particular is very him because he couldn't communicate until he was, um, um, I think he was about four is when he started to really speak. Uh, and also there is a little bit of myself. Like I, when I moved to this country in 2001, I didn't speak enough English. And my son can tell you, my stepson, because he was very frustrated. But I learned a lot from listening to him. We spent a lot of time together and my husband. So, but all I can remember was how difficult it is. And that's why I understand my son. How hard it was to not be able to communicate. I didn't realize how important language was until then. And when I say language, it's not only the way you, you speak, you know, a language, it's everything that comes into communication, which it couldn't be anything. For example, my son, he couldn't point with his finger, and that was part of uh, his condition. 
So it was impossible for him to tell me, I want this, I need water, I'm tired. And so I had to just guess. And it was very frustrating. So instead of language, all he had was like scream. Um, so in this piece, I wanted to go deep into the idea of how we communicate with each other. And then as Diego was growing up and he was developing all these systems of communication in ways that were not uh, regular, so he came up with his own ways and I kind of understood his unique language. So I came to understand that it's not only him or me, it's everybody. Like we all uh, have our own ways to express things and you don't have to be an artist to do that at all. Actually, I think that every person is an artist just by being human because everything that you do every single day is, it comes from you, it's original, it's unique, every step you take. You know, nobody walk, uh, walks like you or moves like you. When you say something, every word is your choice. So everything that we do in a way is, is creating things, creating communication, creating relationships, creating uh, stories and memories and experiences. Uh, so this is a type of language that I'm talking about here. And I just got, now talking about the technical part, I really love challenges. Maybe because my life was so challenging when I was little that I missed that kind of like, come on, you can do it, you know, think, you know, force your brain to find a solution. So I now have an easier life because things are much better around me. So I have to make it difficult for myself as an artist. <laughs> and that's a, a, a very cool thing. So I thought, okay, for this series, I want to make uh, 10 pieces. They all have to be white. And of course, they all have to be paper. And the background is, is gonna be great. So before I started the pieces, I actually ordered the frames. I had everything <laughs> absolutely set up. And then, I said, okay, now I have to do it because I spend the money in this, so I, I have to do it. So that was a challenge, like there is no way, and then Jill trusts that I'm gonna do a good show, so with all those challenges, I started to work. And then it was really fun. The type of fun that comes from struggling with something and pushing yourself and saying, come on, you, you can do that. And at the same time that I was experiencing the process of creating this, of course, I, I was uh, making my brain work. And that's the beauty of uh, being a, a creative person. Like, you always uh, uh, create these challenges for you that are good. So I hope that in the long term, it helps me be, I don't know, alert, aware uh, when my children are older so I can have a long life and continue to be in their lives. So anyway, it was really... Um, a fun experience. So I, it was basically the same size uh, that I wanted to use. As you can see, they're similar in size. Well, maybe one is a little smaller. But later, when you have time and can really see them and, and closely, you'll see the, the variety of ways that I try to treat this paper, um, you know, to create these pieces. So, and again, each one could represent the way in which uh, someone expresses, you know, through language. And again, I'm not talking just spoken language, but just what I was telling you before. So this, this could be like 10 people communicating in 10 different ways from someone who cannot even speak because uh, it uh, um, doesn't have any spoken language to someone that is blind and communicates in different ways. Um, I also, I, and I just, through this series, I want just to invite you to think about the things about yourself that are unique when you communicate with others, but also with yourself. Because if you go inside of your personal life, there are ways that are, it's just you. And I think it's really nice when we identify the things that make us unique and we celebrate that. We don't have to say... I mean, being different is great. We don't have to be like each other. Being human is already what uh, keeps us connected. Everything else, you have the freedom to be whatever you want. So this piece touches on that a little bit. So now we're gonna go to the next series, this one here. So this piece is very special to me. And it's called uh, Misunderstandings. I made 
these, I think there are 32 pieces. They are all made with the pages and the cover of a book about uh, depression. Um, I'm very familiar with uh, depression from uh, people that are very close to me. And that, that doesn't mean that I understand it completely because it's a condition that is very um, complex and we're still trying to understand it. But uh, so the book was about depression. So what I decided was I want to read this book in a totally different way. So I deconstructed the whole thing, re, um, um, uh, how can I say, build the book in this way. And by doing that, I just, in doing this, I wanted to make a point that everything is open to interpretation. Like if, when you have a, a, an intention to say something in a certain way, and I want to connect this with, let's say, someone who suffers from depression and feels very misunderstood because it's really hard to, to explain something that you don't even understand. Um, so I just wanted to create this type of um, work that tells you that nothing is easy sometimes to understand and you just need to just take it in and try to experience um, just the, the, the condition of being human, being next to another human that is experiencing something that is different and just accepting that. So uh, behind this piece there is the idea of judgment. Um, when you read the book, everything is you know, in chapters, it's very organized. But by deconstructing all of that, I just wanted to make that point too that uh, nothing has to be um, always explained. Yeah, so I don't know if you get the point. It's kind of hard for me to, to explain this one, but the main thing that I want you to understand is that it's a, a single book that has been deconstructed and recreated in a way that is still the book. So the book is still there. The words are still there. The messages that you wanted to communicate are still there, but just in a totally different way. And again, it's the idea that everything is open to interpretations. So, uh, now let's move to the next series. Uh, so this series here, the title is Mindscapes. And it's a little bit more representational, even though it's totally uh, not exactly the way the brain is. Uh, but I wanted to come up with eight different versions of how I see the mind. Again, when I look at all of you here, it's just so fascinating. Like each one of us has a unique brain. And that comes from your personal experiences, the way in which you see reality and the way in which you see the opposite of reality. So I just, I, I'm fascinated um, by the, the human brain and by people and by the, the amount of uh, diversity that you find in that whole world that you don't see with your eyes but you just know it's there. You just know that each brain is unique and it's beautiful no matter how it is. And during the uh, making of this series I had a lot of different interactions with people that to me have really special brains. Uh, one of them is a, a man who had a stroke, a very severe one, and it's pretty remarkable that after about a year, he's uh, doing really well. He still has a lot of challenges, but as I was, was talking with him, he was explaining things to me that were so fascinating about how his life changed after the stroke and how he started experiencing his own body and reality and space. Um, for example, one of the things that he was saying was, he said, now I, I can feel space. And he started saying, like, I, I can feel space. I can feel like there is something here. He said, before I couldn't feel that. Like I couldn't, so it was very strange in the way he was explaining it. You know, I couldn't know exactly what that was, but just to me, 
you know, listening to this man who's telling something to me that is extremely real to him. It's, it's his reality, that something that I cannot experience in that way. It just gave me an insight into the beauty of how each one of us um, experiences everything. Um, so the same way I was speaking with different people, you know, it's my son. Uh, I was talking with him about um, solitude, and I asked him, what, uh, how do you feel about that word and that idea? And he actually said that he, I, I told him, like, how is your brain? Can you explain me? And he said, well, what I feel, he said, is like, is this very lonely place. It was a little sad, but if you know him, you understand that it's not really that sad. Like, he's extremely happy in the way he's, he sees his brain being. So he said, it's a, this one place that is very lonely, like nobody's there, but I am very comfortable there, like I'm very happy there. And then I asked him, like, would you get out of that place and experience things in a different way? And he said something funny. He said, well, I would like to keep one foot on my brain and one <laughs> everywhere else. Uh, so it was a totally different explanation, you know, from this other man, and so on. So every uh, one of these humans, you know, had, had a completely different, my mother, who suffered from uh, bipolar disorder, and she's uh, remarkable, extremely creative, even though uh, she never had any education. She had a third grade. Uh, but she's, uh, to me, one of the most uh, intelligent people I've ever met, because her knowledge comes from real life, from the streets, from being uh, extremely poor and having to solve problems. So it's like a practical intelligence, you know, from everyday life. And I had a wonderful conversation with her as well about uh, the way she saw her own brain and the way she looks at things. She's very visual. I actually, I think that you would appreciate a little story that I just, I was talking on the phone with her uh, the other day because I was, I love people and I'm never mad at anybody, but it just happened that I was a little upset at someone who did something not so nice, and it made me really sad and, and a little bit mad, and that's not normal for me. So I called my mom, I said, Mom, I, I just feel so uncomfortable feeling this way because I'm, you know, I'm a, a happy person, and I'm always someone who to be happy. And this happened with this person. She made me upset, you know, she said these things, and I just don't think it's right. And so this is how my mom speaks to me. Great that you call me. This is very easy, Elsa. So this is how it works. You are a house. She's like that. You are a house. And then there is a fence around you. And the, from the outside, people doesn't, don't know that there, are, there is a door. That door is a secret door, right? And I was like, okay, where is she going with this? <laughs> but she said, just keep listening, keep listening. So you are a house, there is a fence around you, and there is a secret door. And only you have the key to that door. And so whenever you find yourself very upset at someone, it's because you probably let that person come in through that door, and she said, and not everybody should get, you know, behind the fence. She said, that's a privilege. Like, whoever comes really, really close to you is someone that earned that right. Because that person was so um, deserving, you know, of the privilege of you as a human, you know, being close. So she started explaining that, and it, it made a lot of sense. I'm not as good as her when she explains that because she's really, really gifted, you know, at, at these things. So she said, this is just for you to understand that when you go in the world, unfortunately, not everybody is going to be your best friend forever. You know, that doesn't work that way. Um, I'm sure you, right now you can think of someone, uh, even at a, 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 a higher level, let's say in politics, without giving you many, too many clues, but you can think about someone that you really don't like, like, <laughs> like, why? So that's what she was trying to tell me, like, you know, there are certain things, certain people that for some, 
like, like it, it's right for you not to open the door for that and just recognize that it, it's just, it's not good, you know, it's not right. So, so this is all to say that this was one of the brains that I was trying to represent here. Um, again, I can imagine right now, and actually that's something that I would love to do one day, to pick up, I don't know, maybe 100 humans and really get to experience some time with each one and create a gigantic series of brains. Uh, so this, almost all of these pieces are the beginning of something else. But that's another, a whole another lecture uh, of how things work in the brain of uh, creative people. But so this is basically the story of this piece, or just an idea for you to understand what it is. And then the last one uh, is this one. So I think it's, very, it's kind of perfect that we are ending the tour with this one, uh, because this one is called Fading, Fading. And that's basically the history of everything that ever existed. Everything starts, goes through a process, and goes away. Like one day, none of us will be in this world. And that's something that I, it's very important to me to remember this. As a creative person, I'm always thinking about the nature of that fading process you know, and how amazing it is that we have the opportunity to do things while we are still on this side of life, right? If there is a lower side, I don't know how that works. <laughs> we have different ways to think about that. Uh, but we're alive right now. So this piece uh, is basically about consciousness, which is basically being awake. We actually die every day when we go to bed and fall asleep and that's it. And then you wake up in the morning, man, I'm still here. Another uh, opportunity to keep doing what I do. So this piece, as you can see, I started with uh, a dark red color and then it fades all the way to white and then it disappears. And I, with this piece, I just wanted to think about this fact that everything is impermanent. It doesn't mean that we're not going to still exist in the memory of other people and the actual things that we build or make or the memories that we uh, experience with people. I mean, people will remember us. But it, it's a fact that we are all here and this is a time for doing the things that we want to do. And it's not only doing things or making things, it's actually just experiencing things such as this a special moment that we're sharing here right now. Um, is if there is one thing that I want you to take with you after you leave the show, is that that each of you has the power to change things the way I try to make the point with paper. This is all paper. <clears throat> it's a simple material. I started with a flat piece of this material and then it's up to you how you're going to transform your life the way I have transformed paper in this room. So uh, I want to be like my mom a little bit right now because she loves to give people advice. <laughs> and then <laughs> uh, if I can give you an advice right now is just leave this room feeling empowered to do all those things that you probably maybe think you cannot do. Your brain is amazing and I have learned that from experience, but not only my own experience, but the experience of all these amazing people that I grew up with. Your brain can, only, can always do more than you think, better than you think. As long as you are intentional, you need to be intentional. You know, uh, half of life happens by, <clears throat> uh, um, how do you say, what is that word? By, um, it, yeah, it just, it happens to you. You don't choose it, it just happens. But then the other half is really, is, is your choice. You have a lot of choices. Uh, and again, you don't have to be an artist or you don't have to be anything in particular. Whatever it is that you do, you have choices to make it more interesting, more meaningful, but also more, more fun. A lot of people are afraid of the word fun <coughs> because it sounds like 
shallow and that is not true. There is nothing in this world that you cannot do if you find a way to have fun, such as what I did when my son uh, started therapy. And it was because of that that this whole thing happened. And be uh, because of that, you are here. So look what a long way from my son started therapy to this day. So I just want to end it right there. Do you want to say anything about the works, the sculptures? Oh my God. <laughs> She's like my second mom. <laughs> so, actually, that piece is my favorite. That's my favorite. And it's called 101 <clears throat> Notions. And each one represents a mental disorder. My whole family is in there. <laughs> a lot of friends, neighbors, and teachers, and people that I have uh, learned so much from uh, in my life uh, so actually these are the people that I have to thank uh, for us being here today I have learned so much from every person that has had or, or has still a challenge and sometimes in the beginning when we, we got the diagnosis uh, of my son I spend a lot of time thinking, you know, like everything has a reason. And I'm, I'm not talking in a religious way or in a... It's mostly like in a, in a human way. Like, why is it that some humans have challenges? You know, what can we take from that? And what I learned is that we are basically, no matter if you have challenges or not, we are all here to learn from each other. You cannot be who you are today or who you want to be in the future by yourself. It's just not possible. We learn from each other. Everybody who can speak today, language didn't come to you from, from the sky. It came from interaction, from imitating each other, from learning from each other, and then coming up with your own ways. So that piece should be the ending of the tour instead of this one, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> because I think that that one uh, really represents this uh, thing that I'm a big advocate for people uh, with disabilities, you know, intellectual disabilities, physical uh, disabilities, because we have so much to learn from them. You know, they go through mo so, much, uh, so many challenges every single day. And um, they become, you know, many of them, the ones that make it and survive and continue to, to, to be alive. And so that's another, a second advice that I'm going to give you. When you leave this place, like whenever you encounter someone like my son, you know, don't, don't be afraid, you know, if they act in a funny way or they move in a different way or they say something inappropriate. Just don't judge and just listen and watch and, and observe. And if you can even talk to that person, and you will be surprised by the things that you're gonna learn from them. Let's leave it in there. Thank you so much. <laughs>
And when you started working on the 101 notions, did you know what that was going to be? Did you know, did you have a list that you were then, I wonder what that would visualize to me? Or did you make objects and then say, you know, these could relate to that? Or how, how did that come about? It's the same thing. The right answer would be, I did a lot of research, and then I <laughs> saw that the reality is, go to Google and Google mental illnesses. So I got uh, to Wikipedia, and I got 100, and there were actually more than 101 uh, uh, conditions. So I just, I did spend some time studying the ones that I didn't know, because I was fascinated by some of them. They were really... Things that you won't even imagine until you read them, like, wow, that's amazing that a person can be this way. So I decided to choose the 101 that were my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, after I had the list, I thought, in a perfect world, now I'm going to start from 1 to 100, you know, this is this. this. But it didn't happen that way. I actually created 101 sculptures, and after I was done, I started matching each illness to each uh, name, and they actually really made sense. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, does anyone else have a question you'd like to ask? No? Yes? Here. When you start a series such as this, do you know what the end is, and where are you starting, where are you going, or are you just building as it comes along? In general, I start with, uh, with an idea, and I try to even find the title even before I start, because that way it's like when you sign up for something, and you say, well, I sign up, I have to show up. So it's the, it's the same way with my work. If I put the title, and I decide even the size, uh, then I feel like I, I, now I have to really do it. Is that also just mental games to make things happen? But, yeah, I have an intention, I have the title. Can you hear me? No, battery's on. Keep talking. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, so I start with an intention, I have the title, not in every case, but in, in general. I, I try to have a lot of clarity about the general idea. And then I start working, sometimes in the middle of the process, everything changes because I find a better way to do it, so I start over again, mm -hmm. but I still keep, you know, the thing, the, the subject, the title. Yeah, so no, that's in general how it works for me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. so I have a question. Oh, yeah, so mm -hmm. just say it loudly. Okay. Yes. When you were working on this, on fading, did you put the pieces up in front of you as you continue to work mm -hmm. so that you could get an idea of the whole? So the question was, when um, Elsa started on fading, did you put the pieces up in front of you to figure out what the order was going right. to be? Yes. Well, in this case, I started with this one. And then, you know, before I framed them, I finished this one. And then I put the paper, the next one, next to it. So I knew exactly where to continue with it. So as you can see, each one connects Perfect. to the next. So it's, it's like one piece, one piece deconstructed in different panels. But I mean, ideally, in the future, as always, I do a piece and then I, I feel like, okay, this is just a, a model for the real piece. So the real would be like at that whole wall, and the paper would be directly on the wall, and it's fading. So, but again, that's the fantasy that artists have. <laughs> if I just have the funding in the future, maybe I'll do that. I think that because, okay, one more, and then because we don't really have a microphone. Um, Elsa, did you use embossing or did you layer? Embossing for this one. Mm -hmm. okay. And you have one back there, can you yell it? Yeah. <laughs> um, so you were saying that uh, you created the objects in your sculptural pieces before you matched them to a piece. Do you feel like the research that you did and the images you were seeing uh, helps you pick out, pick the uh, sculpture that will each disease, or do you feel like it was more of your artistic style and how you relate that into your like mental picture of the disease? Right, there were two parts of creating that whole series. 
<coughs> the first one, as I explained before, was uh, you know coming along with the um, illnesses, and the second one was the, the artistic side, which is just create a huge variety of ways uh, in these sculptures. And then after I was done, I, I that was the part that I enjoyed the most. It, it's almost like naming my little babies. Like you're gonna be schizophrenia, you're gonna be uh, this and that. <laughs> and I, I, I picked them to match my mental idea of what that illness could look like if it was a sculpture. So that that's how it, it happened. Uh -huh. Good. So why don't we? Those of you who have questions, just come up and talk to Elsa. I don't want to have to make everyone yell at this point. So, and then you can also um, enjoy the rest of the museum, which will be open soon. I don't think we're closing down between now and, and members opening. So let's please thank her again for.